welcome to the Give Me Liberty podcast at the Standing for Freedom Center right here at Liberty University. Here's a question as we start today's episode. Do you have a Bible verse or Bible verses that you have committed to memory that you live by? Can you think of it right now? What is it? My guest on today's episode is Colonel Alan West, where he talks about the importance of scripture and how it influences all of life. Alan West is back on the Give Me Liberty podcast, starting now. And welcome back to the Give Me Liberty podcast right here at the Standing for Freedom Center at Liberty University. And I'm joined by a special guest, a dear friend who's actually coming back to Liberty Mountain, Lieutenant Colonel Alan West, welcome. Welcome. It's good to be back with you all. Thank you so much for having me here. Well, we're honored this morning. You actually got to speak to 10,000 of our students Incredible. there at Con Convocation. Yeah. Life lessons. I love how you walk through the scriptures with them. And I'll just say that it, it, it does hold true. You train up a child in the way they should go. When mm -hmm. they're old, they will not depart from it. I remember as a, as a little kid, I was five years old. I was in vacation Bible school, one of the first... Um, memory verses I committed to memory was John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You went through and you walked through the scriptures giving life lessons and principles. Why is it that scripture is so important, young and old? It's a foundation. You know, it'd be just the same as back in the day before all of this computer stuff and GPSs. Uh, if you were out there in the field as a, as a soldier, you had a map and you had a compass. And scripture is kind of like that compass that helps us to negotiate, you know, the map and understand the terrain. And as long as you stay on that asthma, as long as you stay, you know, focus on a true north, uh, I think that that's where you are able to be a champion mm -hmm. for Christ and you're able to be a champion overall. But what I see happening is that when you deviate and you get off course, you know, it may be one degree, but eventually if you you don't correct that, the next thing you know, you're 10 degrees or even more so off. So it's not just for us individually, it's also for a nation. And if you think about how far we've gotten from understanding how scripture and the Judeo-Christian faith heritage played an important part in the, in the establishing of this country, uh, as I told the students this morning, show me another country mm -hmm. that says your your rights, your freedoms and liberties, your, your inalienable rights come from a creator God, Judeo-Christian God. No other country says that. And so that makes the individual sovereign because you have that relationship with the sovereign God. And really, that's what John Locke talked about in natural rights theory. Yeah, that's exactly right. In fact, have you been to the Museum for the Bible? Oh, yes. I so have. so many of many events that we host, we're actually up in D.C. Mm -hmm. We bring our students there, been on many tours, uh, friends of the Green, Green mm -hmm. family, Hobby Lobby. And one of the tours that they take you on, they actually have this uh, 3D ride, you know, that you go around Washington, D.C. And they show in all the monuments, the edifices of the building, literally pages of scripture that have been inscribed that can in stone. You cannot remove them. You'd have to take those pieces out and put up new pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and you cannot re erase our past. That's part of that national history and identity. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about John Locke and you talk about life, liberty, property. Property. Right? Yes. Life, liberty, property. It translated by Jefferson, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. These were ideals that were borrowed. These are borrowed ideas. One, one of the debates that we have hotly contested is about this idea of Christian nationalism. Yeah. And um, I will say it's a leftist pejorative term. It's largely. a boogeyman. That's right. It's a boogeyman That's term. That's right. Yeah. And so the question is, what kind of society are we going to have? And we did have a Christian society where mm -hmm. the majority of the society were, was dominated by Christendom, Christian, Christian culture, Christian uh, writing and literature, Christian music, and also Christian political theory and mm -hmm. philosophy. And so when we look at a constitution or a declaration of independence, we didn't always live up to the ideals and principles enshrined there, but they were not uh, expressions of secular humanism. No. 
they came from the scripture. No, you're absolutely right. And, you know, the preamble of the Constitution talks about, you know, making a more perfect union. So we understand that this is a work in progress, but in a work in progress, you got to have a foundation that you start with. You don't build a house by putting a roof up first or putting the walls up first. You set a foundation. The foundation of this country was the Judeo-Christian faith heritage. And when, when you're there in the uh, House of Representatives, the people's house, and you look up there and along the, uh, the, the midsection, you see all of the faces of the great lawgivers of, of the world. Uh, they're all side face, except mm -hmm. for one. There's only one face that looks at the president when he's giving a State of Union address, look at the Speaker of the House, looks at everybody. That's the face of Moses because he is ultimately recognized here in this country as the great lawgiver. And when you look at the Ten Commandments, it really does form the basis of law mm -hmm. and morality. I, I mean, thou shalt not kill. And so we don't allow people to go out and murder and all of these things. Thou shalt not cover your neighbor's, you know, possessions, your house or whatever. You can't go into my house and take my stuff, yeah. you know, honor your father and mother. All of these different things that came from, you know, those Ten Commandments. But yet, we have a bunch of people that say, well, you can't display that stuff. That's a violation of separation of church and state. But yet they don't understand what Thomas Jefferson wrote in that letter to the Danbury Baptist Convention of Connecticut. Uh, they were concerned that the Presbyterians were getting a leg up. Yeah. Uh, and so they did not want to see that. And Jefferson addressed it, saying that we will not have an established religion. Why? Because of the lessons of King Henry VIII and the Church of England. When he didn't get what he wanted, he became the head of state and the head of church. That's not what we have here. And Christians need to understand that, you know, everyone goes to Romans 13 saying, well, you're supposed to be subject to government. You should just shut up and not participate. Yeah. Well, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were not subject to... They to, said, you have no you have no authority here, king. None. Yeah. Daniel, mm -hmm. no authority. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I always tell people, they created the first tanning salon mm -hmm. when they went into the, you know, the furnace, and Daniel created the first petting zoo. Uh, because they said, we are subject to righteous governance. That's right. Not governance of government that undermines our faith and our belief that is in a higher power. Look at Sir Thomas More. Yeah. When he stood up against, I mean, he was the king's counselor. He stood up against Henry VIII, and he was willing to lose his life for that. So I think that it's time that Christians understand that relationship between our faith and understand that the very first liberty, since we're at Liberty University, that you have in the Constitution is the freedom of religion and free exercise thereof. Yeah. So government doesn't have a right to come in and say, well, you know, we got this virus out there. We're going to shut down all your churches. But we're not going to shut down McDonald's, mm -hmm. Home Depot. So what are you doing? So the left has a religion. That's right. That they've established. Climate change, open borders, gender dysphoria, same-sex marriage, murdering unborn babies. And if you don't fall in line with their religion, they're doing exactly what King Henry VIII did, That's persecution right. and prosecution. Mm -hmm. And we've got to frame it in those terms. Since 1971, Liberty University has had one mission, training champions for Christ. We've been at this for a while, and in the shadow of the Blue Ridge Mountains, we have grown to be a global force. Today, Liberty runs over 100,000 students around the globe, studying across 15 colleges and schools, and among them, over 30,000 military students. Across 700 programs of study, we train as one, nurses, artists, business leaders of the future and today. Together, we work to give back through service trips, local community work, and over 500,000 volunteer hours per year. And we play just as hard as we study with 20 NCAA athletic programs and 40 club sports teams. So who are we? We are Liberty University, and we train champions for Christ. I love what you said. The leftists have a religion. I will add too, and I fully agree, they have a creed that goes along with yes, it. Yes, they do. And so that's like speech codes. You mm -hmm. can't say that. Uh, it, it, these are like blasphemy laws. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a naivety, I will say, and I love what you were saying to the students today. This is good versus evil. It is. There is a naivety, though, among Christians. Uh, I think two things, not understanding, not giving a proper assessment 
of things as they are today, mm -hmm. not fully understanding. And then also a naivety in terms of not understanding our history, our past. Totally. You walk through history like it's, you make it look easy, by the way. Well, I mean, <laughs> life is easy. I'm just a dumb paratrooper. If I can get it, anybody should be able to get it. But, but think about yeah. this, you know, and, and in Finland, mm -hmm. a member of their parliament, was charged and arrested on blasphemy laws because she quoted from the Bible. Right. So now in Finland, they have codified that if you quote certain scriptures from the Bible, that's considered hate speech. Mm -hmm. Think about the, the Polish Canadian pastor who was arrested and charged with mischief, creating mischief. Right. Because he prayed with those truckers when they were saying, stop imposing these unconstitutional rules and regulations on us. And he gave communion to them. And he was charged with creating mischief for prayer and, and for giving them communion. Now, that's our neighbor to the north. And if you don't think that if we're not vigilant, uh, if we're not strong and of good courage, that these things can't happen to us here, they're already trying to do it. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, do, I am uh, heartened by one thing in Canada. It was James Coates that was just recently... Um, I guess, exonerated by the court. Mm -hmm. uh, but even still, that's because they lost so badly in public opinion. Yes. And uh, globally, they know they have no real play here other than to do that. But the difference between their rights and ours here in the United States, we know that our, our rights are derived. Mm -hmm. And uh, government is not the one that grants us rights no. or gives us rights. Those rights are given by God. And the government is there to improve protect and secure those rights. Frederick Bastiat, the law, very simple. Yeah. Government exists to protect your life, your liberty, and your property. And uh, when they get outside the lines or they get outside that constitutional, you know, box, then we have the right as, as the people to, you know, say you're not operating in the consent of the government. L look at what is happening in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. you know, all Governor this, Grisham. Governor Grisham in New Mexico, all of a sudden, a problem that's created by policies of the progressive socialist left, the high crime in these major urban population centers. Well, it's a public health crisis, so I'm going to suspend the, the Second Amendment because no amendment to the Constitution is absolute. you got to be kidding me. Mm -hmm. and, and at least now we have seen the sheriff in the county and also her attorney general saying, we're not going to you know, save you from this. All the lawsuits that are being brought against you, the attorney general said, you know, I'm not going to defend you in, in any court because you're taking an unconstitutional act. But Christians got to wake up to this. Yes. And that's why I stress when I talk to the students today, when God told Joshua, this book of the law, you shall meditate upon day and night. You shall not turn from the right or to the left. I said, it's not just about God's book of the law and God's book. It's about our Constitution. Yeah. Christians have to understand our rule of law is a constitutional republic. That's right. Amen. You know, I think about that. There, there's some lessons there in the Old Testament. By the way, Oz Guinness wrote a book, uh, The Magna Carta of Civilization. He talks about Moses, to, back mm -hmm. to your point in, in that reference. But uh, Sinai, they had no king, except God was their king. Yep. And they had the book of the law. And for 40 years, they wandered around in the wilderness, almost like a republic, yeah. um, pre-king, pre pre-entering um, you know, into the land of promise. But it was not good enough just to have a parchment where those things were contained. If it wasn't written on your heart and on your head, Absolutely. in your mind, and you, had, you didn't have it memorized, what good was it? Yep. There was a point in which people forgot who Joseph was. You think about the patriarchs, Abraham, mm -hmm. Isaac, Jacob, mm -hmm. Jacob, uh, and, then, and then his sons, and you had Joseph. Mm -hmm. They forgot who Joseph was. And they had to be reminded again and again of the promises of God that were contained there in the scriptures and uh, in their family bloodline. And so here we are, you know, it's 2023. And I think one of the things that happens so often is that Christians don't either, they don't know the times they're living in no. or they don't know the history and how rich it is. And I think part of, part of where we faith overcomes fear, mm -hmm. is understanding you're already victorious. Yeah. You've already won. You're a champion. That's right. Talk a little bit about that. Well, you bring up a great point because what you see happening goes back to exactly, you know, Joshua's farewell address when he said, choose for yourselves today whom you shall serve. The gods of the Amorites, the gods from across the river, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he brought that to the children of Israel as he was passing. He said, you know, are you going to continue to worship and honor the Lord and remember all these things? Are you going to be witness to that? Yeah, we're going to do it. All good. And then you flip over to, you know, the next book, Judges in chapter two. Well, Joshua and that generation of 
Joshua passed away, and the children of Israel start worshiping the gods of the Baals. Right. One of the gods of the Baals was Moloch, the god of child sacrifice. And Worship industry. Absolutely. They, the anger of the Lord burned against them. They were given over to plunder and plunderers. Look at where we are. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're no longer energy independent. We got China flying spy balloons all over the country. We got six to seven million people coming across our border illegally. We know that some of them are terrorists and what have you, because we stopped telling the story. Mm -hmm. And and I tell you, there's some pastors out there. Shame on them, mm -hmm. because there's so much worry about a 501c3 status. You know, when when they go on the glory, if they get there, God's not going to ask them about a 501c nah, status. That's right. He's going to ask them, did you preach my word in season and out, like you know Timothy was told? Yeah. Did did you take care of my flock? Did you take care of my sheep? Did you uphold you know our principles and, and our truths as according to you know the word of the Lord? Well, if you didn't do it. See ya, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to be pretty hot where you're going. Mm -hmm. And I think that we got to shake up our pastors. And, and I think that here in a great university like Liberty or Dallas Baptist University where the president sure, and the yeah. chancellor was visiting today, we've got to see that as a critical mission. And that's why I love the theme of Liberty University, training champions for Christ. But what I tried to do today was define what does that mean? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be a champion? And here are some guiding verses that will help you to be a champion for Christ. Yeah, no, that's so, so well said. I, you know, I think about um, this moment uh, with the Gen Z generation, uh, where they are um, getting a sense of all of, re they're digital natives. Mm -hmm. um, many of them walked through the pandemic. They're more isolated than ever before. You mm -hmm. have mental health issues, mm -hmm. you have suicide. Um, how is it that you give them a sense, inspire them with a sense of an understanding of God's purpose and design for their life, but then also how they can live in victory in spite of the, the tumult of the, of the times that we're in? Well, that's what I tried to do this morning with the students. Uh, and I told them champions don't hang out with losers. Right. And, and, Our and founder, by the way, said, by the way, said that, uh, that you are... That we are, in fact, winners. He yeah. gave a, a speech on this, you know, 20 years ago about that very thing. You can but choose yeah. to be a victor or a victim. That's right. And if you are in Christ, you're a victor. It says that, you know, I, I'm more than a conqueror. Uh, the world wants victims. The progressive socialist left wants victims. They want people to be dependent. They want people to be depressed, despondent, and all of these things. They want people to give up hope, and, and, and that's not who we are. And so we have to be that salt. We have to be that light. Uh, and we have to cast it upon the darkness and illuminate more people. But first and foremost, we got to have it, like you said, within our own hearts. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that we meet young people today where they are on all of these social media platforms uh, and not run away from them. And we have to speak in language that they can understand. Because mm -hmm. I don't think anybody wakes up, young, old, whatever, and says, I want to suck today. <laughs> Okay. Right. I, I just I just don't believe that. That's right. But if the only message that they hear is that you suck. Yeah. And and the only people that can save you are us, mm. which will, you know, we'll give you a little pittance that you can get by on. Yeah. That's the essence of Marxism. Yes. Karl Marx hates Christians. He hates Christianity. He called it the opiate of the masses because he wants people to believe that man can give you happiness. Here. Right. That ain't that ain't the truth. That's right. Man can't do it. He's always going to let, let you down. So we have to bring that message in. And as I said in the final uh, verse, James 1, 2 through 4, count it all joy. Yes. We got to be happy warriors. We got to go out there and we got to have that Christian character and that aura about us. The people come up and say, with all the craziness going on, how can you be like this? I want some of that. Mm -hmm. We want people on our team. That's right. Not the other folks' team. Amen. So you're looking for a university that's perfect for you. A school that has anything you could possibly need. Anything? You want a place that has the programs you want to study. And maybe a few more, just in case you change your mind. I think I'm going to sign up for the fashion design program. All right. A place with state-of-the-art facilities. I mean, look at this campus. And who doesn't love big town sports? And great recreational activities. Okay, now we're on a roll. Somewhere you can hike, slide, strike, shoot, climb, eat, and most importantly, eat. You want a place that takes you to space? Okay, maybe not, but we can teach you how to fly. 
or pastor a church or run a business. And all that with a great view? Yeah, I think I know a place. Uh, by the way, going back to the scriptures, something I taught, I was taught at an early age. Uh, in middle school, I had a Bible teacher mm -hmm. who forced me to memorize the book of James. Mm -hmm. So the beginning, you know, James, the servant of God, Lord Jesus Christ, to mm -hmm. the 12 tribes scattered among the nation's mm -hmm. greetings, consider it pure joy, my brethren, whenever you face trials of many kinds. I, I, I turned to something you said a little bit earlier, and it was about, you know, basically it's preaching the gospel, but it's failure to extend that to the aspects of life or its policies, its principles, mm -hmm. its people. Oftentimes, I think it's, it, you know, there is a focus in the church today that we just need to preach the gospel. We just need to preach the gospel. Um, and, and my first question to them is, that's great. What is that? Yeah. And so a lot of times they're not even doing that. They're yep. preaching moralism rather than justification by faith alone in Christ alone yep. because of his finished uh, work at the cross and his yep. resurrection victory. Um, so instead of preaching life in Jesus' name, it's more about these moral platitudes. But um, there, there's, it's almost like the bridge connect to practical things like the issue of abortion, yeah. like the issue of marriage like uh, policies when it comes to economic and whatnot, they're not connecting the dots. They don't make it relevant. That's right. And and I think that's what's so important with what you're doing here with the Freedom Center and the policy aspect of taking the Christian faith and taking the Word of God and translating it to what we see happening today and helping pastors, helping others to understand these issues. Look, Deuteronomy 30 and 19 is pretty doggone simple. You know, I, I set before you today heaven and earth uh, and this choice, life and death. Choose life yeah. so that you and your descendants shall live. That's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're calling yourself a Christian and just last week we were up in Ohio yes. because of the important decision that they'll be making about codifying murdering unborn babies in the womb all the way up to the time of birth and maybe even after. That's infanticide. That's right. Uh, how can we codify that? How can how can pastors, you know, sit back and allow that to happen? And so we, you know, talked to a bunch of black pastors and they got it. A couple of them got it. I mean, there were some of them that came to this e event. They were on the other side. But when you hammer them with the truth, mm -hmm. you know, the way, the truth, and life, when you hammer them with the truth, you got to tell them either some part of you is in conflict because you can't say that this is who I am on Sunday. Then Monday through Saturday, you jacked up, man. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I, I think that's what we have to do. We've got to make the Word of God relevant to the issues and the things that we see today. God, God got it right. God made Adam and Eve, male, female, man, and woman. You know, this is not the Tower of Babel moment. We can't go in there and, and you know, mutilate our bodies and mutilate the bodies of our kids and think you're something different. Mm -hmm. No. That's God, right. God, God made, it, made it right. That's awesome. I totally agree. And juxtaposing Babel, you had Pentecost, where in the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. uh, everybody could hear the preaching of the word and understand it. That's right. Uh, and made it, it made it plain to them. And the, the, the message of the kingdom was very, very simple. Repent and believe. And be saved. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and be a victor. Be a champion in this world. Amen. So great to see you again. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. You're always welcome back. Really appreciate you stopping by the Give Me Liberty podcast. And folks, stick around for final thoughts. Folks, thanks for watching the Give Me Liberty podcast. Please like and subscribe. Are you on Apple iTunes or Spotify? If so, please leave us a five-star review. I want to go back to a couple of points on our conversation we just had with Colonel West. He is a proven leader. He is a man of high principles and a deep abiding commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has committed the scriptures to memory, and he is also a good cultural and political exegete when it comes to understanding the times that we're living in and how to apply scriptures to all of life. So often we either find two different extremes, one being the total abandonment of the Christian doctrine and Christian ethics in order to reach for some kind of political influence or political power or political victory. That's pragmatism. 
The other extreme is a fastidious legalistic pietism that swallows the camel while straining the gnat. That is to say, we cannot get our hands dirty by engaging in public or political discourse, so we need to just absolutely stay out of it. That's neither practical nor faithful to what God has us all to do in living out our faith and occupying until Christ returns. So what scriptures have you committed to memory? Do you have one? One of my favorite verses as a teenager came from 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts, honor Christ as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that's in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Not only is there an obligation for the Christian man or the Christian woman to be prepared for a gospel encounter, a ready-made go-to apologetic defense, but also an obligation for the Christian man and the Christian woman to not be petulant or rude about it. Remember, we have already won. Our defense of the gospel needs to be mindful always of that victory. As Paul, the other apostle, says, we are ambassadors for Christ's sake, making an appeal to be reconciled to God through Christ. So read the word, know the word, memorize the word, live by the word because it is life giving. And by God's grace, you will keep his word and in it, you will find your freedom. Stay strong and keep standing. Until next time, God bless you.